I'm Farouk Tahid. Family unites us, helps us heal, and makes life even more special. How amazing is that? So we're taking two people on the ultimate adventure to explore the stories hidden in their family tree. Yeah, baby, yeah. Along the way, they'll discover their past, great moments in history, and most importantly, each other. Get ready for the trip of a lifetime on Roots Less Travel. Now, you guys, y'all living in St. Louis, right? Well, I do, yes. Oh, you do? I live, well, I live in Los Angeles. Summertime came, you know, school lets out. Soon as summertime hit, I went straight to L.A. And I just ended up staying, never going back. I didn't like that he was here. Oh, okay. Away from home. Now you've left St. Louis. You're like thousands of miles away. You groomed him to spread his wings him. and fly, Absolutely. right? You just didn't expect him to fly so far away. Exactly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, let's <laughs> trace your roots and yeah. let's check out your family tree. Right there, Lawrence Ford. Yeah, Lawrence Ford. Lawrence. That would be my mom's dad. I never knew what year he was born. Look at that, 1918. Wow. wow. That's 100 years yeah. ago to this point right now, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. What if I told you we can go back 200 years? Wow. Wow. I'm so excited. I want you guys to check this out. 200 here. years? Mm -hmm. So excited. Start from top to bottom, left to right. Just tell me what you find. OK, so I've heard of the Tennessee of my wow. family. Wow, here got the Fords. Larkin Ford. Yeah. This is an 1860 census. Wow. Dang. Like so, the census report. So 1860. Okay, yeah. Larkin Ford, how old is he? He was 45. 45. He was close to my age. If he was 45 in 1860, when was he born? 1815. See, I told you, that's over 200 years now. Mm -hmm. This is where I came from. <laughs> These are the men that I, you know, follow behind. There you go. We believe this is your fourth great grandfather, Devon. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, fourth grandfather. Back. Hold on, but let's, let's think about this. We're talking about your family history right now, going back over 200 years, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. That's pre-emancipation. Oh. In the South. In the South. <sighs> oh, my gosh. They were doing big things. Yeah. This wasn't yeah. above the Mason-Dixon yeah. line. This wasn't south. the Definitely. North, you know, this yeah. was the South. Your family made the free inhabitants list in the South, in Tennessee at this time. That resilience. That's phenomenal. See how it all kind of comes down? I'm so down? proud of my family. <laughs> By 1860, there were almost half a million free African Americans living in the United States, but only 7,300 were free in Tennessee during that time. You guys have a rich family legacy that we're gonna go back to right in Tennessee. That's amazing, oh my God. Y'all ready? Uh, yeah. I'm ready. Our journey begins in Nashville, the state capital. The scenery is amazing. It is. I love this country scenery. I am so <laughs> hyped. Yay! <laughs> I'm taking Devon and his mother, Cherie, to the Tennessee Supreme Court to uncover a landmark case involving their relative, Larkin Ford. Yes. Oh, this is beautiful. We have an exhibit here about the Ford case right over here. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. That's how important this case is. I want you guys to take a closer look. Wow. In Ford v. Ford, the owner not only freed African Americans in his will, but left them his farm. <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> Mr. Ford died in 1843, and the sons attacked the will. Two of his sons challenged the will on several grounds, including one, the beneficiaries of the will were not proper parties because they were slaves. When the case went to the Tennessee Supreme Court for the first time in 1846, Justice Nathan Green remanded it back to the circuit court in Washington County. His statements about enslaved people were very important at the time. A slave is not in the condition of a horse or an ox. He is made after the image of the creator. He has mental capacities and a moral principle by his nature that constitutes him equal to his owner, but for the accidental position to which fortune has placed him. Equal Power to his owner. Mm -hmm. Powerful gosh. statement. Yes. Powerful statement. Now you see why we're here. Your four times great-grandfather fought for his freedom in the Tennessee Supreme Court. 
This was before the Civil War. Yes. This is pre-emancipation. We're talking about this was 1843. In 1850, after seven years of bitter court battles, Larkin Ford was granted freedom, as well as the land he inherited. My family and some good people were able to change history from the way we know it now. Today, we're bringing mother and daughter Gwendolyn and Gabrielle together in Rockville, Maryland, and taking them on a historical journey back in time. I'm Gabrielle Dorsey. So I grew up in Maryland, just outside of D.C., with a huge extended family. I'm Gwen Dorsey, born and raised in Rockville, Maryland. I've been an educator for 33 years. Family uh, is everything to me. Mom! <laughs> good to see you. Welcome. It's so good Welcome to see home. you. I missed you. <laughs> I can't imagine going through this journey with anyone else. All right, looks like Gwendolyn and Gabrielle, I see there. Hey, yes. how you doing? Great. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. You guys ready to talk some family history? Absolutely. All right, well, come right. this way with me. Now, you both are educators. You've devoted your lives to teaching. What I want to know is just starting off from the top, what do you guys know about your family history? Well, I know Mom has a few photos. This is my mother, uh, Virginia Cooper, uh, when okay. she was younger. She, growing up, always told me a ton of stories mm -hmm. about how she grew up in North Carolina on a sharecropper's farm and had 12 siblings. Oh, wow. I have another picture of my dad, Joseph, uh -huh. with his mom, Malloy, and the other siblings. I really just want to know how my ancestors lived. I want to know what their values and beliefs were, mm -hmm. and I want to know what kind of people they were. I got a family tree here. You guys want to take a look at it? Yes. Right, I think it's a good place to start. That's me. That is my name. And we got Joseph Cooper in Virginia. And then we head on over. We talked about Malloy. Henson, Carol, and Florence Hayes. So now Henson, Carol, and Florence, Gwendolyn, it would be your great-grandparents. Oh, yes. And that and would make my them... great-great-grandparents. Yes. My heart is beating a little fast. 13th Census of the United States, 1910 population. Wow. Looks like five daughters and a son. And then next we have the age. And Henson was double the age of Florence. <laughs> wow. 73 and Florence was 36. Ooh. If Henson Carroll was 73 in 1910, he was born in the 1830s. That leads to some compelling questions. Was Henson a former enslaved person? Mm. We learned some important details about your family history already. And I mean, I say we go to our next stop, see if we can uncover We're ready. more about Henson's early life. More than ready. ready to go? Absolutely. All right, let's take a trip. Thank Come you. On. Let's go, no problem. Look at the grounds. Look wow. at these homes. They're gorgeous. Today, I'm meeting them at the Lincoln Cottage in Washington, D.C. This is where our 16th president developed a lot of his ideas that would shape his presidency. You got a little, little hmm on yeah. you. What, what yeah. are you thinking? I'm thinking that Henson must have been enslaved. With Southern states seceding from the Union, Lincoln and like-minded lawmakers had the votes to pass a bold new law in the District of Columbia. You guys have any idea what he decided to do? Besides the Emancipation Proclamation? <laughs> no. no. He signed a bill that freed all the enslaved persons in the District of Columbia. Wow. And that was actually eight and a half months before the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay, that's wonderful an act for the relief of certain persons held to service or labor in the District of Columbia approved on April 16th, 1862. And listed includes Henson Carroll, 20 years old, male. This was the document that freed my great-great-grandfather from slavery. I'm meeting Gwen and Gabrielle at the Pamplin Historical Park, a 424-acre exhibit and actual Civil War battlefield. We're here to learn the significant role that the United States Colored Troops played during the Civil War. The Union Army's Bureau of Colored Troops was created in May of 1863 and included a familiar volunteer. This, Henson Carroll's military service record. Oh man. Oh. Henson Carroll of the 1st Regiment, U.S. Colored Infantry, aged 21 years, enlistment, 
June 21st, 1863. Vincent Carroll, he answered the call. Oh yes, he did indeed. There's power in that, I love that. Next, I'm meeting Gwen and Gabrielle at the African American Civil War Museum in Washington, D.C. I have a surprise for you. There's a gentleman here who's just as interested in the U.S. color troops as you are. This is Andre Halsey. How are we doing? Nice How to meet you, sir. Hi. Nice, nice to meet you. This is Gwendolyn and Gabrielle. In researching the first United States colored troops and going back through my own family history, I dug up some, some old photos. The first of these is a picture of my great-grandmother. Oh, that looks familiar. Very familiar. <laughs> seen that picture before. Yes, yes. In the picture is Henson Carroll's daughter, Malloy. She's both Andre and Gabrielle's great-grandmother. My grandmother is Elizabeth. So there you have it. You yeah. guys are family. <laughs> so nice to meet you. Yes, you too. <laughs> so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. This is nice. This and is I wonderful. Have one more picture that's really special to me. It is actually a picture of Henson. Wow. That's amazing. So he's very, very handsome, I yes. see. We can, <laughs> now, <laughs> yes. we can now see how he got Florence, right? Right, right. To have a picture right. of Henson Carroll, who I feel like we've been chasing, um, right. it's just so amazing. Yeah, I'm kind of awestruck. My mom is about to celebrate her 97th birthday. She wanted to get her DNA tested, so we decided to do it together. I found three members of my mother's family. Hello. I can't believe it. <laughs> finally oh, made it. <laughs> Patty, Damon, what's hey. happening? Hey. Welcome hey. to hey. Evesham Township, New Jersey. You guys weren't getting started without me, were you? No. <laughs> no way. All right, good, because I got a lot of good stuff for you guys. Follow me inside. Thank you. Oh, this is so amazing. Exciting. You guys have any idea where we are? Patty, any idea? We think we're at the place where my grandfather went to church. We're at the Cropwell Friends Meeting House. And this place was established back in 1809 by the Quakers. Quakers, also known as the Religious Society of Friends, have been in America since the 1650s, even before Quaker William Penn founded Pennsylvania. In 1688, they were the first religious body to formally condemn slavery in the English colonies. I'm shaking. I just feel so emotional. Give me your emotional. hand. Give me your hand. Let's, let's, let's. Come on, because this is going to be a journey that's going to be amazing. So this is a census from 1905. And when we go down here, you see that name there? Evans. Evans. Joseph and Lydia Evans. And then when you scroll down, look who else was living there with them. That's my great-grandmother, Mary Truitt. And then Blanche Blanche is my great-aunt, and Clement is my grandfather. When his father passed away, his mother was left with four children and no income. So she went to work for the Evans family, and he and his older sister, Blanche, went there too. Research from our sponsor, Ancestry, took Patty and Damon back two more generations she discovered an unusual lineage of black family freedom in the early 1800s. The fact that Major Truett's name is listed on the 1840 census before emancipation tells us he was free and not enslaved. We're gonna go back even further and find out some more. You guys ready to do that? Yes. How you feeling about that? Yes. <laughs> this is like a dream come true. Next, I've invited Patty and Damon to this beautiful historic home and farm in Marlton, New Jersey, filled with rich history and a heartwarming connection to their family's freedom. You guys are right here at Hillside Farms. Now tell me, what do you guys remember about the name Joseph Evans? That's where my grandfather lived as a boy with the Evans family. And guess where he lived? Right behind me. Are you kidding me? Wow. That is amazing. Now listen, I brought somebody along with me here that's gonna break it down for you and tell you all about this house. Come on over here, Connie. Hi. This is Connie from the Evesham Historical Society. This area is part of the original 1,000 acres that William Evans purchased in 1701, and it remained in the Evans family until the early 1970s, so that's pretty remarkable. We always heard stories about the Evans family and how they took in my great-grandmother, my grandfather, and my great-aunt right. after my great-grandmother's husband died. They opened up their heart in their home to my family at a time when clearly my great-grandmother needed it the most and treated us like part of the family. 
I mentioned to you that her name was Connie, but I did not tell you what her last name was. Connie. This is Connie Evans. <laughs> so she's of the Evans family. I grew up here on Hillside, Clem Truitt used to come visit. That's my grandfather. Right. <laughs> Your great grandfather. <laughs> so y'all pretty much family. Oh, thank you. This is so wonderful. The connection I felt when I met Connie was unbelievable. I felt like she was part of our family. She was shaking. When I was hugging her, I could feel her shaking. Immediately, I felt a connection.